here's a disease argument. Most doctors, this comes from Louis Pasteur and other medical doctors who follow the, the work of the germ theory. And that is, any disease you have an organ, you have a defect in that organ, and you have identifiable symptoms. In addiction, when we medicalize this, when we talk about it as a disease, that the organ is the brain, specifically we're going to talk about the midbrain today, the defect is a physical, cellular, hedonic defect. Hedonic means, it's, it's another fancy word for pleasure, it's the pleasure system of the brain. And the symptoms that come from that defect in that organ are cravings, obsessions, preoccupation. Let's compare it to another disease. On the bottom here you've got a metabolism rate, so all the activity that's going on in a heart of a patient with a heart disease. On the left you have a healthy heart, and on the right, you have a diseased heart. You can see that there's clear differential activity between the healthy person and the diseased person in that organ. So that organ on the right of the heart has some type of defect. And we're seeing that. We can see it through imaging. If we look at the brain, on the left side, you have our control person who's a healthy, normal, functioning person with a normal brain. And you can see their activity patterns. And on the right, we compare it to someone with a cocaine abuse problem. And you can see the diminished yellow, which is the higher activity, the yellow and the orange and the red. You can see that there's diminished activity in various spots of the brain. So this is just another way to say, look, we know that there's an organ, we know it's got a disease, and if we look at it, we can see that it's functioning differently. But for a long time we'll say, yeah, this person's got a heart disease, that, that poor patient. We ought to treat them, we ought to help them. Now only that we're starting to get more science can we start saying, well, that person's a patient too. They've got an organ that needs treatment and it's not working correctly. Addiction being a brain disease, it's important to say that um, genetics play a huge role here. Between 50 to, and 70 percent of the disease of addiction is accounted for by genetic factors. This is from Dr. Kevin McCauley, who did a, a video called Pleasure Unwoven. And he uh, is at the Institute for the Research on Addiction. He says people's brains fall into one of two categories or somewhere on a spectrum in between. There's people with soft brains and there's people with hard brains. And he compares it to rock. Hard rock brains are like granite brains. You pour chemicals on them, and they have their effect. They go through the experience, and then they're done. They're like that person that George said. They experiment, and they, OK, that was what it was. But they move on. Their brain isn't fundamentally changed. And there's a part of the population who has this really soft, malleable, soft rock brain. What happens with them is water, wind, elements, chemicals come in, and they shape it and change it fundamentally. And that's what happens in the brain of the addict. The chemicals, the things they're experiencing, the behaviors they're doing, are weaving through and shaping their brain. Their pathways are changing. The brain is fundamentally changed. We know that it's not all genetics, but you gotta have the genetics to be able to become an addict before you can truly become an addict. The brain has to be able to change. Depending on where I fall on that spectrum of how sensitive my brain is, that's going to determine how quickly I get there. This is all called the dopamine hypothesis. In our brain, we all have a midbrain. Everything it does, it does involuntarily. How many of you have been breathing while George and I have been speaking? Okay. How many of you have had your heart beating while George and I have been speaking? How many of you have had to tell yourself in your body and your mind to make sure that your heart beats? A midbrain, deep down, not below your level of consciousness, it's programmed to do that for you. Its job, its function is to keep you alive, and you go on about your day being human. Well, that part of the brain sends off a chemical called dopamine, and this all centers around the dopamine hypothesis, that everything that can become addicted involves the release of dopamine. So that brain that's supposed to keep us alive gets us doing certain things, and when we do them, things that will be important for our survival, when we do them, it'll release dopamine, which will create a pleasure experience. And the brain makes it pleasurable because then we'll remember it and we'll do it again. And that's supposed to work for us with food, with sex, with sleeping, with everything that's going to keep us alive and regenerating and growing as people and society. And we all have a set point in our brain where if the dopamine hits a certain level, we go, ooh, ah, that feels good. If you've ever walked outside on that perfect day, the sun's shining, you feel totally hydrated, you just had a great night's sleep, your, your, your dopamine levels have, have leveled out and they hit this set point and your brain feels good. You feel normal. 
But what happens in addiction is normal dopamine surge that comes up here and hits this original set point and goes up and down. We get satiated and then it tells us to crave and we want it and we do it. The drugs release these huge spikes of dopamine that the brain's not programmed to take. But what the brain does with these huge dopamine spikes is this isn't normal. This isn't right. I need to keep things the same. It does a few things to try to combat what's going on with its chemical changes and shifts in the brain. And when it can't figure that out, when it can't keep homeostasis, it resorts to a process called allostasis, and it raises our set point. It says, fine, I can't reduce your production of dopamine. You're still using and getting that spike. Fine, I can't push back with a stress hormone. You're still getting that spike. I'm just going to, I give up. It raises our new set point. And then we're sitting there with decreased levels of dopamine and everything else the brain tried to do, yet our set point is up really high. And so that's where people in addiction, you'll often hear them say, I have to use just to feel normal. You and I, when we go outside and when we engage in normal everyday behaviors, we get enough dopamine to feel kind of balanced and feel kind of normal, everything's okay. Addicts in their active addiction, when they go outside, they feel like there's something missing there. Their brain is craving chemical balance that it doesn't have. And this process gets deeper and deeper and embedded in the brain. That explains tolerance, why you have to drink more to get the same effect. That explains withdrawals, why when you go off of it, you start to get the shake. We're gathering data on functional near infrared spectroscopy. That is measuring frontal lobe brain activity in, in patients with addiction who are in recovery. Then we measure their galvanic skin response, and then we get a couple other things. And what these really do, this green brain down here is the midbrain. That's the brain making you breathe, that's the brain making your heart beat. It's all involuntary. And so another way of saying what addiction has done to the brain is where we normally have this back and forth communication between the blue part up there, the frontal cortex, and the green brain saying, hey, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I need this. And the front brain says, okay, go get it. And they work together as a team. What happens in addiction is that link gets broken. And then the green brain is totally in charge. And it thinks everything's about survival. We want to measure how is the brain recovering itself? How is, what is the activity going on in the midbrain versus what is the activity going on in the frontal cortex? And can we, can we see uh, something over the course of recovery? And we've got these different imaging and uh, magnetic and electro techniques to measure some of this. We show recovering alcoholics right now a set of images, a positive image, something that would make the amygdala, which is down in that midbrain, think, ooh, I like that, I want to approach. Uh, that makes me happy. That's good. That's not, that's not a threat to my survival. And then we show them a neutral image that their amygdala really shouldn't care about. We show them a negative image that would make their midbrain go, ah, that doesn't look good to me. Because each of you, when you just saw this dog, programmed scientifically and genetically, what just happened is your amygdala freaked out and it sent a chemical message up to your frontal cortex all within like 33 milliseconds. And your frontal cortex said, that's a picture on a PowerPoint here at the TLPDC. Quiet down. Send the message back to your amygdala and your amygdala said, okay, I'm good. But the problem in addiction is you don't have that link feeding back anymore. And so the amygdala says, that's a dog. And then you're, you're paranoid. So if anyone who's ever been bitten by a dog or had that trauma might be sitting in here going, I don't feel right. I don't feel comfortable, even though this is just a picture, because that link gets changed. And then we show them a picture of alcohol, and so we can see where it compares to these other cues and what's going on in their brain in recovery. Here's just a couple of studies we've done. This is uh, brain activity for a group of recovering alcoholics who looked at those pictures. How long were they in recovery for? Anywhere from one to ten years. And what this picture is of is this is the unique activation of someone who's been in recovery very little time, maybe one year or so. Is it time one to two a years. critical factor? Yes. Time abstinent is a yes. critical factor. Yes. Right? Yes. So they've been in recovery one to two years compared to a group that's been in recovery about eight to ten years. This is what's going on in the brain of the recently getting into recovery person compared to the person who's been in recovery a long time. When they look at an alcoholic image, this is activation that goes on in their brain that the person who's 10 years down the road doesn't have. Those two areas are the dorsolateral regions of the brain, which are our stop-go system. They're the brakes. So their brain, because they're in early recovery, is trying really hard to inhibit and say, don't do that. And they don't work so hard at 10 years down the road. That was with 
time. That was just activity with time. And we saw those are the dorsolateral regions right there that were working really hard for these people early in recovery. And later in recovery, they kind of fell off. With time, we know the brain is healing itself. The brain wants to heal, heal itself. This is now looking not at time, but looking at people who get help <coughs> and learn to cope differently in their life. So we looked at brain activity as it associates with people's reported ability to healthily cope with stress, with school, with work, various aspects of their life. And what we found is, not only does the activity that's working really hard to inhibit behavior stop, addicts who are high copers start to get this frontal lobe activity right here in the middle polar regions of the brain, which is called the uh, dorsal medial area of the brain. And what that area does is the highest level of executive thinking for humans. It's where we do all our moral reasoning. It's where we really connect most in our relationships with people. It's where we plan and future events and stuff like that. And what we know is that as people learn to cope in recovery, not only can they lose the, the constant break that the brain is trying to put on so that they don't mess up again, that can kind of heal itself and then people learn to cope and start using a part of their brain they weren't using in their active addiction. This is the part of the brain that, and they've done alcohol research studies, that shows atrophy. If, if alcohol is used long enough and severe enough, it starts to deteriorate. And we know that active therapy, active coping, active recovery helps heal this. Recovery is not just abstinence. Abstinence is important. If I stay abstinent, my brain comes back online, my frontal cortex, and I can have enough activity in certain behavioral regulatory areas where I'm not going to actively, compulsively use all the time. But recovery is more than abstinence. The rest of my brain needs to heal and come back online. The part that makes me have meaningful relationships, the part that helps me accomplish great things in school, the part that has dreams and goals and plans. And that doesn't just heal all by itself. That takes active work, whether it's therapy, professional help, um, learning to cope. But we see that as that happens, not only do our breaks not become so intense and obsessive about not using, but the middle part of our brain that it gives us more choice, more reasoning starts to heal itself as well. These two graphs here um, are talking about a, a startle mechanism. So while people are looking at those pictures, we also play them a, a startle, right? If I pound at the desk right now, all of you would jump. You can't help it. It's wired into your, your genetics. We all, as human beings, have a startle response. And then when we play them that sound, it's really annoying when they're viewing the pictures. We can measure how quickly their eye blinks, how intense was their startle reaction to it. And we can tell by the blink magnitude and frequency, was it a voluntary blink or was that due to us you know, in, you know, inducing this startle probe? And then we can measure how intense their amygdala freaked out during an image when we showed him something and, and get these reports back. And so again, here's our hoping and coping responses. Basically to us what these graphs mean are that things are healing not only in the frontal cortex but deep in the midbrain in the course of recovery. People are starting to be able to have normal emotional responses, not just conscious responses but underlying emotional responses to everyday things as they heal in recovery. So it's happening not just at the frontal cortex, but at deeper levels of the brain. Because you'll hear those addicts who you know, say, well, I, you know, my grandparents took me to Disneyland and I didn't want to be there, I just wanted to go use. Well, that's because their brain isn't in the right place. They're in a state of high set, high set point, normal things don't bring normal pleasure, and that needs to, be, to come down. So we're just seeing evidence that not only the frontal cortex heals with time in recovery, it heals with active work and coping in recovery, and that is affecting the disease, most disease part of the organ, which is the midbrain deep underneath.